Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel, I'm a draftsman, and uh, today I am talking to you about the fifth of Dennis Dutton's cluster criteria for art. I'm going to read the corresponding excerpt and then I will muse about it a little bit. If you'd like to support my audiovisual channel, you can do so by liking and sharing this video and also by subscribing. These are all immediate and at no additional cost to you. If you'd like to support what I do with money, it's also very welcome and appreciated. You can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, which is gabriellahandle.com, just one word. You can purchase crafts I make from eBay. You can buy prints of my drawings, or you can leave me a tip. The link for all of those things will be in the video description caption. Thank you for your time and attention, and let's look at this uh, next criteria for art, according to Dennis Dutton. My, is it the fifth? No, it's the sixth. <laughs> God damn it to hell. Um, okay, the fifth one was criticism, and the sixth one, which is the one that corresponds for today, is representation. Um, so let's review the criteria first. Number one, direct pleasure. Number two, skill and virtuosity. Number three, style. Number four, novelty and creativity. Number five, criticism. Number six, representation. Number seven, special focus. Number eight, expressive individuality. Number nine, emotional saturation. Number 10, intellectual challenge. 11, art traditions and institutions. Number 12, imaginative experience. I wonder if I put the wrong number for the criticism video. That's annoying. Okay, all right, so let's read the representation section. Uh, quote, representation. In widely varying degrees of naturalism, art objects, including sculptures, paintings, and oral and written narratives, and sometimes even music, represent or imitate real and imaginary experiences of the world. As Aristotle first observed, human beings take an irreducible pleasure in representation. A realistic painting of the folds of, in a red satin dress, a detailed model of a, scene of a steam engine or the tiny plates, silver, silverware, goblets, and lattice crust cherry pie on the dinner table of a doll's house. But we can also enjoy representation for two other reasons. We can take pleasure in how well a representation is accomplished, and we can take pleasure in the object or scene represented, as in a calendar rendering of a beautiful landscape. The first is about skill, rather than representation as such. The second is reducible to pleasure in the subject matter rather than representation itself. Delight in imitation and representation in any medium, including words, may involve the combined impact of all three pleasures. In parentheses, blueprints, newspaper illustrations, passport photographs, and road maps are equally imitations or representations. The importance of representation extends to every area of life. End parenthesis and also end quote. Mm -hmm. All right, let me think here. Uh, because the word representation is so tarnished. Um, let me see here. Okay. Uh, okay, so... It seems like he, from what I understand, he's talking about what you're looking at as your reference material versus what you make on your canvas or paper. So representational art is realistic work for the most part, you know, generally. Um, based on what we can see with our eyeballs. 
Uh, so landscapes and the figure, animals, plants, this type of stuff, for example. I mean, in case you need to clear that up like I do. Uh, I have an, um, kind of like an idea. Um, and so there seems to be... Uh, so I understand that, from what I understand, he's saying that you can enjoy both that which is being represented and the way that it's being represented. So if you have a painting of a mountain, you can enjoy the fact that it's a mountain that was painted. It, uh, you know, you think the mountain is, is amazing, but then you can also enjoy how the mountain was painted. So, you know, if that scene is very preciously painted with little animals and it's like they're very detailed or like if you can appreciate the atmospheric perspective that the artist put into it, um, or if it's like painterly, you know, where you can see the brush strokes, or if you enjoy the color palette the artist used. So like that aspect, those, uh, these last few things are enjoying the way the mountain, the mountain was painted, not strictly the mountain itself. I mean, I think, I think that's an interesting distinction to make. Um, this is a little bit unrelated to this part of the text but um I feel like or you know maybe just like in my opinion there is no there might not be such a thing like as an abstract painting and everything and every work of art is representational because as I have mused in previous occasions even abstracts which are things purportedly not based on anything in particular are indeed based on something. Whether it's the color palette or just like the appearance of the thing, you know, the image of whatever that is being represented, um, it's based on something. Um, even representational work is also, it's also always based on something else. Even if like the first time that it was based on something was just like directly nature. And then from there, from like the per first person that made a nature painting, then somebody else spun off you know, copy them, oh, I'm gonna paint nature too, you know, and then movement started and all of this stuff. Um, but, you know, if we think about seeing the night sky and the pictures of the nebulas or just looking up at the sky just like in general and looking at clouds, uh, looking at the sea, uh, looking at a texture of trees, uh, I think all of those things, I mean, t anything that one can think of that we are arguably very familiar with, all of that stuff, e easily is an abstract. It's like if you look really closely at the iris, for example, like that's a classic, you know, it, um, I mean, not only is it amazing, obviously, but that is abstract. If you get closer still, it's an abstract. If you look at like the the inside of the eyeball, like these these pictures of, uh, I don't know what it's called, the vitreous humor. I don't remember if that's exactly it. But the gel that is inside of the eye, you see the those like red-orange pictures of the insides of there? That is an abstract, you know, like this type of stuff. Um, so even the human body is an abstract. Um, so th what I'm arguing is that even abstracts that are supposedly not based on anything are still empirical images meaning that whether whether the artist is trying to to like deconstruct I don't want to use that stupid word um, whether the artist is trying to like break down something that the artist is very familiar with and make it unrecognizable like that is still it's like you're still trying to break down something that you already that already exists um or whether you're zooming in a lot on a certain part of the body or or 
any natural texture. It's like all of those things are still based on reality. Um, so yeah, that's a little tangential. Or maybe not, because then I guess what I'm saying is that abstracts are also representational, uh, also involve the representation of reality. Um, and this reminds me, you know, because Dennis Dutton is saying that we make this stuff because we like looking at it. And indeed, we like looking at nature, we like looking at the human body, which is a part of nature. It remind and uh, it reminds me of something Carolyn Edland, what episode was that? Episode, episode 70 of my podcast, The Conversation About Art. When I asked her what beauty was, she said, uh, because she said that nature is, I mean, beauty is nature appreciating itself. So because we are of nature, humans, and we make these things that we see in nature, and then we enjoy looking at them, it's like, that is straight up nature appreciating itself further still. Uh, I like that a lot. That's really cool. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes, I like that a lot. Okay. Yes. I think I'm going to leave it at that. Not super long or anything. That's fine. Not a big deal. Right? Not a big deal at all. Um. I think I'm indeed gonna leave it at that for today and tell me what you think about Dennis Dutton's like breakdown of the term representation of how he breaks down the representation of the reference material based uh, the reference he breaks it down into reference material basically you know what you're looking at and then the rep the way that reference material was put onto the paper or the canvas or the, or the sculpture. Um, that seems like an interesting thing to discern. Yes, what do you think of that? Um, so, okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. And I hope you're enjoying this series. And if you're not, I guess tell me why not. And uh, if, should I add anything else? Or... I guess I'm just curious. Uh, I'm enjoying making this series a lot. And, well, we're already almost... We're halfway through because I had the numbers wrong. This is number six. I must look again. Right, number six is representation. Halfway through. We're halfway through. All right, so everyone, thank you very much for your time and attention, and have a fantastic 